Top Bird Talk. This is part two of a two-part piece. Don't forget to check out the show notes in order to listen to part one. We have our fourth speaker. One of the things that we've increased our repertoire with a lot over the last few years, and particularly during COVID, has been high-flow oxygen. So use of nasal high-flow oxygen. And it's a pleasure, hopefully, to bring in... (laughs) Dr. Anil Patel. Hello. Hi. Fantastic. Anil, uh, hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, I, I haven't seen you face to face for too long, but I do feel very familiar with your study these days. <laughs> Anil, can you, can you introduce yourself, please? I'm an anaesthetist at the Royal National ENT and Eastman Dental Hospital, part of UCLH, the mothership. I'm a colleague of Jim's, and I've known David for 25 ish years. And just like Jim, I got the call in March last year, uh, just as the COVID crisis was kicking off in the UK, about this idea of trying to help people with negative pressure ventilation and excellent. And it's a very similar story. So we've been involved with that project since its inception. And it's uh, it, it's been a fascinating journey. I echo much of what's already been said, really, the kind of initial, this is old technology, this is black and white photographs, this is large steel boxes, uh, you know, row upon row of them with slightly faded photographs. It's old technology. It's it's not new. It's not fresh. It's not modern. And all of those things uh, we, we've, as a group, we've experienced when we've tried to explain X event and the concept to lots of different groups around the world. But actually, when you, when you sit down and you you, you go through the the history, as, as David has done probably better than anybody, um, it becomes very apparent that actually. Uh, it might be old technology, but it's it's physiological, uh, and there are uh, some definite advantages to to reintroducing this and, and and really spreading it around the world. First of all, I'm going to ask you to just give us give us a little bit of the history of the uh, Thrive, you know, high flow story and the AVMF, and then perhaps when you've done that, a little bit of reflection about that journey and maybe the scepticism or not that you had early on and how that relates to X-Event. So in 2013, the nasal high flow device was brought into the ENT hospital and it was principally brought in as an attempt to see whether patients who were recovering from anaesthesia could benefit from it. There'd been some trials and some data suggesting that utilising nasal high flow in some capacity during the recovery phase because of uh, because of the improvements in, in sort of alveolar ventilation in spontaneously breathing patient, it might be beneficial during recovery. So we were used to having lots of relatively new pieces of equipment or kit coming through and just having a look at it and seeing what we thought of it. And then there had been reports and the critical care environment in particular had been utilising nasal high flow for about a decade before that. It's been used as a sort of pre-oxygenation tool. So we thought we would use it in a pre-oxygenation environment and we really noticed that actually it wasn't just a really good pre-oxygenation tool but actually you could spend a really prolonged period of time in an apneic phase so you had induced anesthesia in a patient you had paralyzed that patient and you could have five ten minutes and longer of an apneic phase using the high flow technology and the patient didn't seem to desaturate. So I remember there was one particular patient with a trainee quite early on where I was expecting the patient to desaturate within two or three minutes. We put the high flow on, paralyzed the patient. They were doing various things with laryngoscopy, trying to intubate that patient. And before we knew it, sort of 10 minutes had evolved and the patient hadn't desaturated. Oh, it was interesting. We looked at the CO2 trace when the tube finally did go in and we realized that it was nowhere near as high as it should be. And that really evolved into, that became a standard tool for difficult airway management. And then that transitioned into actual procedures. So we sort of got comfortable with five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And the surgeons were very keen for us not at times to instrument the airway, particularly with complex or very subtle laryngeal pathology. So it then became a sort of standard tool for undertaking laryngeal surgical procedures, where we were then giving patients at near for really quite prolonged periods of time. And I think the last time I had a look at the data, we were up to about 1,200 patients, so 1,200 patients um, with an average at near time of about 30 minutes. Um, and of course, the CO2 does go up. Uh, and we keep an eye on that. It's not going off the scale. Uh, so there's lots of things that we obviously be very wary of and transition into utilizing it. But 
Anyway, since we published our initial observations of just 25 patients, we had 25 really tricky airways, we published it. We called the technology Thrive because we wanted to differentiate it from spontaneously breathing nasal high flow use. So this is apneic use. It's, uh, and the important thing there was that it, it stands for transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange and it's the ventilatory exchange that was very interesting because what we were seeing was that the co2 rise in the, during apnea with it was nowhere near as high as we were expecting it to be uh, typically about a third that work was then replicated in multiple centers across the world particularly for ent type procedures at the current time it's been introduced into sort of national guidelines across the world. So difficult intubation guidelines, tracheal intubation guidelines, internationally and across the world. It's then had a phenomenal uptake across a whole broad spectrum of procedures during anesthesia. So obviously the critical care environment are very familiar with it. They've been using it for years, but in anesthesia, it really sort of kicks the, the Thrive paper kickstarted all of that interest. And it's now utilized and there are multiple publications. There's something like sort of 220 something publications now in the anesthesia sphere, not in the critical care sphere. And that encompasses procedures from sedation through to general anesthesia, through to helping during tracheal intubation, through to extended apnea usage. And at the moment, I think when I last looked, there was something approaching 150 WHO registered clinical trials that are coming through as well. So really in the anesthesia field from nothing, in 2013-14, a lot of interest in the last five, six years in that sphere. So that's kind of where Thrive or whatever you want to call it has come in. There's been a lot of work done on the mechanism of action. So we couldn't really quite work out why the CO2 doesn't rise as much as it should do. And there were lots of theories early on of why that should happen. There's been some very good papers coming through. I've been involved with Fish and Paikal, which has got a very significant sort of scientific base. And these PhDs coming through in collaboration. Uh, there was a paper published a year and a bit ago around the mechanism which we think is going on. And the mechanism appears to be a sort of combination of during the apnea phase of flow vortices that get transmitted down the airway, uh, superimposed on cardiogenic oscillations. And that combination is just enough in adults and in some groups to release pulses of CO2 and therefore drag back in again some extra oxygen. And that seems to be the mechanism by which there seems to be some CO2 clearance. Now, again, that's, it's, again, it's interesting because that hasn't been replicated in all the papers. Very early on in the, some papers from Australia looking in children in the paediatric and neonatal group during the apnea phase, the CO2 rise is still taking place. In some studies, in some adult groups, there doesn't seem to be the same blunting of the CO2 rise. So uh, there's obviously individual variations, there's group variations, there's study variations, but a number of publications and studies around the world have shown some CO2. That's a sort of longer term use. The, the main use, I think, for all of this technology is around airway management, either during sedation, because it basically people don't desaturate if you've got it on, and during tracheal intubation, during that laryngoscopy intubation, oh dear, I've got a problem, I can't put the tube in, I need some extra time. And it's, and it's very useful for that, for that process as well. Anil, thank you. I mean, amazing story of, of innovation and implementation. And forgive me for introducing you as Dr. Anil Patel. I've uh, neglected you and our Professor Anil Patel, not surprisingly, given all the work you've just outlined. Did you meet scepticism? Was it an easy ride with Thrive, or did you have the sort of scepticism that you come across with X event early on? No, we didn't at all, actually. And I think the reason why it's been adopted in a relatively short period of time, six years from the initial paper, is just because whoever used it could immediately see that the patients aren't desaturating. So it was sort of self-reinforcing. It was almost, yeah, that's great that you've got these papers, but I've, I can actually see that when I put this patient to sleep, I'm expecting them to desaturate and they're not. I mean, it's obviously not 100% and there are failures and it doesn't work all the time, but in the vast majority of the time, it provides an added safety net in situations where uh, to any practicing clinician, it's pretty clear that things are going to deteriorate. It's interesting, there are some innovations that require a very solid evidence base. Exavent is an example of that. So um, uh, in the sense of we, 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 we're having to push really hard to, to explain to people the physiological basis, 150 year history, uh, why just physiologically it is a superior ventilatory tool than positive pressure ventilation in most cases. And we have to keep explaining that. And we need 
literature and evidence that back that up. It seems because some audiences go, well, there may be something to this. Whereas with Notes of High Flow, uh, with Thrive, it, it was pretty obvious. You put it in somebody's hand, it's very straightforward. You put it on the nose and turn the flow up and they could see that there were, there were advantages to it. So it's frustrating that the obviousness with which uh, the nasal high flow thrive has been introduced isn't quite as um, straightforward with, with the accident. I guess you had the advantage that you had a technology that was there available, the kit was available, and, it would, and the regulatory barriers were not in place, whereas something like Exavent, it's a whole new item that's got to go through various approvals and the rest of it. You're quite right. So the nasal high flow has been in the critical care environment for you know, over a decade. But actually in anaesthesia, I mean, myself included, in 2013, I'd never seen it, heard it. I didn't know what it was. And I suspect the vast majority of anaesthetists who work just in an operating theatre and don't have an overlap with critical care, they didn't know what it was either. You know, as you're going around, it, you know, what is this? What do you do with it? Where do you put it? What flow do you put on? So it was a similarly unknown technology into the anaesthesia world. But because you could see very clearly that it was useful, that was one of the reasons why it got adopted very quickly. A bit like, um, a, bit like uh, a laryngeal mask airway. So, um, you know, uh, David will tell you the whole history of the laryngeal mask airway because he was very instrumental in its adoption because Dr. Brain did a lot of the initial um, had a very work with him. But again, with a laryngeal mask, when you went round uh, early on, it was, you know, how do you put it in? What do you do with it? What, what, what do you we put it in and it worked. And therefore the literature and everything followed, but it was people had, had the confidence that, okay, I can see that there's some benefit to this. And if we can get patients and we can get uh, people into the exhibit, that will become just as obvious. It is, it, it, it is a superior tool for the vast majority of patients in the intensive care unit, not the ones at the extreme end of the spectrum that need clearly need intubation, very sophisticated positive pressure technology, or even ECMO. But that whole early intermediate group that will, that can really benefit from it. We just, we need to get patients into it. And we, uh, and we need, um, and we need clinicians to see that, oh, there is, that, that, that this is, this is clearly better or as good as. Brilliant. So listen, I've got some audience questions. I'm going to come back to David. So aerosol reducing virtue of IPPV, so you've got an endoscopical mm -hmm. tube, closed circuits, mm -hmm. not the same with negative pressure ventilation. Oh, it's interesting how that viewpoint has changed just over the last few months. And very recent research on aerosolization. And the key to that very often is what's going on in the room and the throughput of air within a room when you're doing procedures. And of course, once you've intubated a patient, you've got a cuff tube in, in aerosolization. It's less. Uh, when you're doing the intubation, the problem is patients coughing, and that is a different ball game altogether. In the initial thought, we thought, well, negative pressure ventilation with the patient awake um, would be less of a problem. But the point now is that with the aerosolization on any ward environment, because a lot of negative pressure devices could be used on a ward. It would depend on the airflow through the ward environment. Take a ward that's got CPAP and BiPAP. You're going to have less aerosolization on those wards. That works. So, our, I mean, our experience of COVID is we now have at least 50% of our patients will start on CPAP or yeah. high flow. So, <clears throat> so I guess that's less of a, a distinction. Um, I've got another question. Possible advantages or disadvantages of using negative pressure ventilation in combination with intubation? There's Over been an support. excellent study by Constantinos Ramondas. He actually did a trial published in 2012. Intubated patients, negative versus positive. Well, which had the best oxygenation? These were seriously ill ARDS patients. Who got the best oxygenation? Positive pressure or the negative pressure? Who got the reduction in cardiac output? The negative pressure group were 35% improved on the positive pressure group in that group of patients. It took him ages to get that published. Ages. Well, we may see uh, positive pressure is going to increase the airway pressure. Negative pressure is going to negative effect on pleural pressure. You're going to have a huge transpulmonary pressure there. And an awful lot of, again, it goes back to the tidal volume debate. And a lot of stretch, I would have thought, if, if we overdo the positive pressure on top of a negative pressure. 
a sock if you like, a push in a sock. Okay, I guess you, I mean you've got on one hand, you're adding if you intubate them, you're adding in the yeah. disadvantages that you alluded to of sedation and instrument yeah. in the airway. Uh, but on the other hand, you you could combine. You could too. Yeah, and a very interesting combination that we look forward to evaluating is a little bit what you've just been. The idea of a negative pressure device with high flow nasal oxygen. Now that has considerable physiological, could have considerable physiological advantages. And high flow nasal oxygen is certainly proven in the paediatric population. I think it remains to be debated in an adult population in recent circumstances. But the idea of negative pressure support plus high flow nasal oxygen. But then you're back to oxygen, which again, if you start talking global health, oxygen is a massive problem. And one of the advantages of a simple exavent device would be that Jim mentioned the work of respiration. A lot of children and adults with acute pneumonia, they die because they get exhausted. You can imagine, we don't know, I could certainly imagine children in a simple device on room air with CNEP or minimal MPV helping them, helping them survive over a few days. And the idea that acute pneumonia around the world in children causing all those deaths is going to be sorted out by antibiotics. Well, it's not. It hasn't been. One and a half million children still, but, and even if you've got the availability of antibiotics, well, um, pneumonia? Well, there's these things called viruses <laughs> that produce pneumonia. So <laughs> antibiotics have not <clears throat> been and are not the cure for acute pneumonia. And the world and people will continue to need respiratory support. But presumably, if, because you're separating your inspired gas from your process of ventilation, mm -hmm. you also could mm -hmm. focus a lot on oxygen conservation. Yes. So working off an oxygen concentrator with a Yes. Your semi closed system in a low and middle income country, you know, resource poor environment. Exavent plus a simple oxygen face mask may be a very good way of supporting a large number of people's ventilation. Whereas CPAP, the newer devices, and Mervyn and the UCL's team, they are much better oxygen conserving. But of course, the old CPAP devices can require an awful lot of oxygen. The other issue, of course, is uh, your tolerance of hypoxia, which is up your street, Mike. Or should we set our level of tolerable oxygenation mm -hmm. and that's kind of changed a little bit in the last few years yes I suppose. absolutely and room air room air is um, good stuff yeah well, nice it is, i mean the oxygen thing yeah. appears to have changed ahead of the trials we now have the trials to compare lower and higher oxygen but we're struggling because many people have already decided that lower is, lower is better but we'll, we'll see how that story develops and the other thing about the thrive uh, is something I, i've done over the years many for a different intubation where you follow the bubbles but to follow the bubbles, you do a pass an act of expiration that also helps, I think, also get the oxygen in and the O2 clearance. If somebody squeezes the chest, you agree with that, Neil? The odd time if you want to prolong your period. So I've got sorry, two, two fascinating questions. One of them's just disappeared from the screen, but um, so, so front of neck, uh, and I think we still have Jim and Neil with us. Jim, less certain, but Neil, Neil's definitely there. Um, so. As, a, as an adjunct to front of neck access in difficult airway situations, you know, nearly, nearly closed cords, is that, is that something where you have clinical experience uh, or certainly views in relation to um, the Thrive technique? Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I, essentially, for many years now, if, um, if we have any, any complex patients, uh, we'll be placing the, we're placing the nice high flow on. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, sometimes when you're managing complex airways all the time, uh, sometimes you have underestimated or overestimated the difficulty. So the principal call is, uh, can I actually put this patient to sleep? And you make that call because you think that you can uh, somehow intubate that patient. And occasionally we get it wrong. And occasionally we think we can intubate somebody and we can't. And they need front of access, front of neck access. And I had a, a, a few occasions, one very memorable occasion where I had uh, quite a few years ago now, it was about five, five-ish years ago, had uh, some visitors from Australia and we were demonstrating the Thrive technology on a head and neck list. And we placed the tube. So there was a senior surgeon, myself, uh, a consultant anesthetist from abroad, and we placed the tube through what we thought was abnormal but 
uh, an abnormal airway, but it's gone down the right hole. And then uh, sort of 30 seconds, a minute later, there's no CO2 coming out. We're all looking at each other going, well, is that in the right place or isn't it in the right place? Don't really want to take it out because, you know, it's been a bit of a struggle getting it in. It eventually became very obvious that it wasn't in the right place. We took it out through this whole period we had um, high flow nasal oxygen on, um, thrive on. And uh, we had a few more attempts and uh, it became obvious that actually we weren't going to get it in the right hole or we traumatized things or we had, the things had deteriorated and we now needed to do front and neck access, which the surgeon did. Now that was a good 10, 12 minutes and maybe more. That patient did not desaturate during that period. Now the advantage of, and the reason why the reasons why it's particularly useful head and neck cancer patients is by and large, they are thin and cachectic. And as long as you have a hole, the hole doesn't have to be very big, but you need a hole that goes through to the trachea, um, they, they seem to maintain their oxygen saturations. Um, so, uh, so I think it is a really useful thing to do. If you look now at national guidance and a number of papers looking at anybody who comes in with a stridor, one of the things with structured airway, one of the things that is recommended is put some nasal high flow on. And if you're going to manage that airway, you're going to intubate that patient and anesthetize and paralyze them, keep it going, keep the flow up, because that definitely buys extra time. So in terms of front of neck access, uh, yes, it is a good idea. Um, what it won't do is if you haven't put it on and you're doing all the standard things, so using a face mask, everything deteriorates, you've decided to do front of neck access, the patient has desaturated largely because of some form of compression atelectasis, uh, obstructed airway. At that point, it's pointless putting it on because the flow rates are not sufficient, even if you do have a hole, to reinflate that atelectatic lung. At that stage, you need a significant positive pressure, which is going to be with a face mask and, you know, 20, 30 centimetres of water pressure to bring that deflated lung up. So if you've got a blue patient, it's pointless putting it on, but it'll stop you getting to that blue patient. Really useful. And another question, and Jim may be able to answer this, I believe he's online. So in terms of practicalities in the unfortunate event of cardiac arrest, how is it, and we're, we're talking about X event now, how is it for the X event device to be opened up to allow chest compressions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the X event vessel is split into two components. There's a base plate which lies on the mattress, and then there's a vessel lid, if you like, a canopy, which locates onto the top. That's located by um, two clips either side, which are very easy to flip. And as the, the device is so lightweight, it's easy to remove as well. So we think we're pretty confident that you can get that off very quickly. Excellent. Although the picture of the Marshall's Aerospace one looks substantial, it weighs only 10 kilograms. A single person can lift it off, and two nurses, even two small nurses, can easily lift it. It's a matter of 10, 15 seconds. And because the head is outside of the seals, um, we actually have done this, the, uh, the ergonomics of it, intubating. Um, at that point, you saw Peter um, eating sandwiches and drinking. Uh, we also did a, a pretend attempted intubation on him. But, uh, the dynamics and the ergonomics are very important and future devices will be lighter and, and, and sleeker still. In fact, our, our friends in Bangladesh have already made a very lightweight fiberglass device because one of their engineers is a prominent in boat building. And it can be, it's got a single handle on and can just be lifted off. The question's very much been in your mind on the development. Yes, journey. absolutely. Yeah, because of that occasion. What is more in our mind is the advantages of cardiac output, which negative pressure gives free cardiac arrest. Yeah. Excellent. And I've got another question, which uh, Rodney might be more up your street. So, so how has the experience of the last 18 months altered your view of the benefits or risks of different modes of delivering positive pressure ventilation? And I think they're particularly interested in, in um, APRV. Yeah, basically it's a bi-level uh, breathing system breathe at a higher peep. Either you love it or you, you hate it, uh, I suppose. Um, I have very, very limited experience um, of it in, in, in my career. Uh, one of my colleagues who's just back from uh, North America uh, used it a lot and says it's a much more comfortable way of breathing. He's a lot of time for it. Um, the peep is limited, again, going back to the ventilator-induced uh, lung injury or the self-inflicted lung injury um, paradigm. And it has, possibly has that benefit in that they're breathing on a, a safe 
uh, sustainable uh, peep, if that is the right peep, I suppose. I've, uh, in theory, a lot of time for it. In, in practice, um, I think that um, I, I have very, very little experience of it. And I think the older ventilators, in terms of you know, gas supply and so on, um, I think they just weren't up to the job. I think some of the newer generation machines possibly are, in terms of rapidity of response and so on. So, yeah. so we, we yeah. have actually used it quite a lot during COVID. COVID. We, had, we had it before then, and we used it a little bit. We've used it quite a lot. And I have to admit to being initially sceptical on a sort of standard Luddite basis that mechanical ventilation isn't that complicated. Maybe you, you, you can usually turn the dials to make a patient comfortable, but it, it's been very striking that some patients seem to just settle really well on APRV yeah. in a way that's difficult to get to fix with a standard set of IMV settings. Yeah, I mean, um, it's reverse IE ratio for spontaneous breathing, if you like, so yeah. it's maybe the best of both worlds, I suppose, yeah. It, it does seem to work very yeah. well for, for some patients. And did. the patient's awake, aren't they? They're, they're, they, they, then they can be. Yeah. The, the yeah. challenge we did have, though, was that, that because it worked, people were very reluctant to turn to sort of wean to something else. Typically for the COVID patients, they're a bit fragile, so when you try and wean them, they fall apart a bit. But just sometimes they're kind of, this is too good, too good. I don't really want to break anything by changing things. So we struggled a little bit with getting people off APRV. And the other thing I suppose uh, it involves both of you is um, I would thought this is much more comfortable if you hadn't an endotracheal tube in, be much more comfortable with a tracheostomy. And mm. What's your feeling on an early tracheostomy? Get these people out of ICU and if you have a ventilator shortage and so on. Yes, well, it's a simple fact that you all know. I mean, a, a tracheostomy halves the work of breathing. It is that simple. And uh, people get that sometimes. So whatever your views on tracheostomy are, and the tracheostomies have to be done well, and they have to be done safely, whether it's percutaneous, whether it's open technique, real attention to detail, no post-op bleeding, no dislodgement of tubes, tracheostomy care, terribly important, just the same as endotracheal tube care. But um, tracheostomy is half the work of breathing. Uh, they do make it better under virtually every circumstance. Did you practice it during COVID? I mean, did it help <coughs> get people weaned off? Tracheostomies? Yeah. We did a lot. We, we were initially... And off sedation and everything. Yeah, literally a bit nervous because of the whole uh, aerosol generation, but, but in the end we, we did many tracheostomies without any major problems over and above what we'd see normally. Um, the thing about aerosol generation, I mean, um, we've had this discussion, it, it doesn't figure much nationally, but amongst doctors it does, I mean... <clears throat> Surgical masks are 80-85% effective, even for some degree of aerosolisation. But um, when you're doing any procedure, you need an FFP. And then if you've got a pad mask in the theatre, you're, you're fine with all these things. Again, facility doesn't apply all over the world, but um, PPP3 masks should be available to surgeons, anaesthetists and critical care doctors all over the world. And then this worry about aerosolisation, which is a true, true worry. And again, talk about learning from the past. My generation of young doctors, we were always told TB was droplet and fomites. And oh my gosh, no. Subsequent <laughs> research showed it was aerosolisation. It's no surprise to me at all that COVID-19 virus Spreading is by aerosolisation. It, it is. Uh, it's been interesting that actually the intensive care staff, the doctors, the nurses, and everyone else seem to have been relatively protected because of, I think, fairly assiduous use of very good PPE. Mm -hmm. And it's the it's the other folk around the hospital who sure. maybe felt less at risk who've, who've had a sure. greater hit. And they're not working in an environment necessarily with a decent airflow in their particular room. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the things. Yeah, a lot of hospitals nowadays have no windows on them or open. But and uh, yeah, investing in good air conditioning, I guess. There's some excellent ENT research being done at the moment, will be published soon, about um, clinical rooms, doing nasendoscopies and all, all the things that ENT surgeons do. Taking a swab, doing your flow test, and it depends on the number of people in the room, what you're doing, how much coughing and sneezing is going on, but basically the airflow through the room is the thing that protects you. So I'm conscious we've got Two anaesthetists who are not regular intensive care practitioners, two intensive care enthusiasts and a surgeon. So I'll start with Anil and Jim, if he's still with us. Do you think positive pressure ventilation, so what we consider as the standard of care on intensive care now, so endotracheal tube, positive pressure ventilation, do you think it will still be the dominant technology in 25 years or, or will we be in a much more mixed economy? 
Anil? I think we're going to be in a mixed economy. Early intermediate problems where you don't actually intubate somebody will be a mix of uh, CPAP, high flow and negative pressure. As you start deteriorating, there'll probably be a mix of those. So you, as you were discussing earlier, it'll be perhaps nasal high flow at negative pressure. And if you're still deteriorating, then it will go to either negative pressure ventilation formally or tracheal intubation. And that choice will probably be made on the ability of the patient to maintain a patent airway. And there may be things that we can do to promote that. I think we'll see a transition from that. And I think we have to, because we know that, you know, basically, from, from a sort of lung oxygen transport perspective and from a cardiovascular perspective, all the literature to date suggesting sort of 20 percent ish hit on both of those factors by just virtue of positive pressure ventilation. So if you can reduce the incidence of that, then that might be easier. I, I see, again, I need to bring the LMA back in again, but I see quite parallels to that. So you have a less invasive technique that gives you just as good results if not better, without some of the trauma and without all the potential of putting a tube down and the problems related to that. It's different, but there's similarities with that whole journey. And I think what we're about to go, the journey that we're about to take uh, in the critical care environment, 20 years, 25 years time, there'll be a small group of people definitely need a tube, an even smaller group of people that definitely need ECMO, and then everyone else will be a mixture of relatively non-invasive techniques. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. Uh, now, I, I'm not sure if we've still got Jim or he's actually halfway across. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we do. Excellent. Jim, no, what, what's your view? I'm now in the basement of the ferry. But this is such an interesting question, Mike. I think I'm in the mixed picture bag. I, I wonder in the future whether we're going to have combined ECMO and renal replacement therapy machines. So one washing machine that does the whole job. I remember looking at the pathology specimens from the Royal College of Pathologists of the whole lungs, admittedly, obviously, post-mortem, but looking at that lung and just thinking this has no features of an organ of gas exchange why are we flogging it i wonder whether we'll regard the lung as going from fair game for gas exchange to something that needs to be put into spa conditions to heal and i wonder whether negative pressure may help that process i definitely see negative pressure in the early stages complementing cpap maybe offsetting progression to ippv by reducing inflammatory pathway mediated sort of iatrogenic positive pressure damage and in the weaning phase and then in the domestic phase and the low to middle income phase. So I, I think it's all up for grabs. But, but if David Howard's got a spare five minutes, I think he needs to build a, a, a renal replacement ECMO combined machine. I'm, I'm sure Val will be delighted that he can do that in his spare time. <laughs> <laughs> David, what's your view? Actually, following on from that, Malcolm Coulthard, the pediatric doctor from Newcastle, Malcolm has designed a neonatal device, blood exchange, which he started off in his garage and which is currently under clinical trial in Great Britain. I'd just go back to my global health. Um, I would like to see negative pressure reintroduced, not in competition, alongside positive pressure. We need the clinical trials to show where its true benefits should be, depending on our physiological viewpoint, but we need to, we need to show that. And then a cheap device, I mean, we've already got it down to less than $500. Our aim is a, a, a simple negative pressure device, a pump, a cabinet, and, um, and get them out around the world. Obviously, technology, as we've discussed, changes all the time. It would be lovely to see that uh, device that Jim's just described. It reminds me of a doctor in the space program bones who had the small box <laughs> where he could just turn the dials and do everything but uh, we're a little way off from that but, but you sound you're a uh, mixed economy yes Excellent. definitely now Rod rodney you, the, the first the first three answers are, are from uh, card carrying ex event enthusiasts so have to be taken in that context where, where, do, you, where do you think we're going to end up it's, it's hard to see beyond the box sometimes isn't it um we've missed from advances, a lot of advances maybe in positive pressure, mechanical ventilation. Um, there's a lot more uh, work to be done, um, I, I think, uh, including the, 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 the phases of when to say stop or when to escalate, if you like. So when to go from um, the high flow, the negative pressure, um, up to um, intubation, mechanical ventilation, and then we're going to step up from there and stop harming uh, lungs, if you like, and going on to um, maybe other um, uh, processes. And uh, again, go back to the lung safe study, uh, we're still not um, doing it right. I like the, the idea, it was mooted, I think, by 
Talon Rose Group in Boston of ventilatory teams that go around uh, the bigger hospitals uh, with, with their bag of tricks uh, and, and try and sort out some of these issues. Uh, so they, they would maybe come around and put in say, an esophageal balloon mm -hmm. and just measure transpulmonary pressures and, and work out best peeps and so on. Uh, and then another person on the team or the same person might have good skills in lung ultrasound and be able to identify advance or worsening of um, lung function. Uh, it's a skill I don't have, um, but it's wonderful to see somebody who has good skills um, improving lung, uh, deteriorating lung, pleural effusions, pneumothoraxes and so on. Uh, so ventilation teams, respiratory teams, going outreach, if you like, is an attractive idea. And the other thing I would possibly see happening in, in the near future is somebody's going to come along with the biological and stop all this in the first place, stop um, the inflammatory. It's, it's already it's, happening, Rodney. Uh, happening uh, some new yeah. drugs being looked at yeah. to uh, stop ACE2 being such a problem. Yeah, yeah. stop it before it starts. Yeah. Yeah. Magic bullet for lung injury. Yes. It's a fact. Yeah. Well, that's, that's another story. It's a little way to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a little way to go. My good lady's sitting over there, and she's uh, uh, very familiar with many of the modern biologics. But there's a way to go there. Uh, it's interesting, Mike, when you're at a conference and somebody asks you about the future, you know you must be getting old. Because when you're a young doctor, nobody asks you to comment on the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's reassuring if that's the only reason. You know, <laughs> Excellent. Well, so I, I have to say, I'm a, I'm a mixed economy believer, mixing technologies. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, yeah. maybe a bit of negative pressure with ECMO or even, you know, negative pressure with CPAP so you lose the airway collapse issues mm. that you might have. Whatever yeah. you decide, it has to be based on sound physiological principles and ultimately on clinical trials. Yeah, let's see how it, let's see how it all plays out. So, listen, I'm going to. I don't know if Jim's still with us, but I thank him for uh, uh, fighting the technological challenges. Anil, if you're still there, fantastic. Thank you both for joining us uh, remotely uh, and contributing to an excellent session. David, thank you very much, uh, and Rodney, it's been a delight co-chairing with you. Safe so, journey. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out edpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organising around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.